Hi, and welcome to another bite size revision session. In this session, I'm going to talk to you about patient assessment prior to oral surgery procedures. There are three key things we really need to focus on. One is the patient, two is the operator, and three is the procedure itself, the surgical site. And I'm going to talk about those three in a bit more detail now. So first of all, before we get into those three components, I want to just briefly talk about history. Because when we take a history from a patient who's presenting to us, that will give us an idea of what's going on. And that history is really important. So if you see a patient in the acute phase, you want to get a good pain history. And to ensure you get a good, thorough, detailed pain history, you can use the mnemonic Socrates. And that will allow you to dive into each section, giving you an idea of what actually is wrong with the patient. And really, from a good pain history, you should be able to start to work out that differential diagnosis in your head. So what's the most likely diagnosis from this history? Is it irreversible pulpitis? Yes, it probably is because of the symptoms the patient's given me. You also want to ask about a medical history, and there's a separate video talking about medical history in detail, but certainly go through the systems in a systematic way. I generally first ask about allergies, do you have any allergies to anything? And you want to focus on medications, but also it's useful to know are these individuals atopic, so do they have lots of allergies to things? Go through your medical history in a detailed and systematic way, and that might be going through respiratory system first, asking about asthma, COPD, etc., cardiovascular system, any chest pain, any high blood pressure, any heart problems, and working through in a really systematic manner so you cover everything. Once you've done your medical history, ask about any current medications. Current medications that are prescribed by their doctor, but also do you take any over-the-counter medications on a regular basis as well? Once you've combined that medical history and drug history, you should start to get a vibe for how well that patient is. We also want to ask about their dental history. If they've been referred to you and you're in a referral practice, do they see their regular dentist um, on a regular basis or are they an irregular attender? What's their anxiety level like towards dental treatment? Ask about social history. Are you currently in employment? If so, what is it you do? Do you smoke? How long have you smoked for? How many do you smoke a day? It's also important these days to ask about vaping as well because that may well have an impact on the oral health and certainly healing after a surgical procedure and the alcohol intake. Do you drink? Do you drink regularly? Are you a social drinker? If so, how much would you drink on average per week? And that will give you that nice rounded history for that patient so you are informed as to their medical, dental and social history. Once you've gone through their history in detail, you want to assess the patient, and that would be in the form of an extra-oral examination and an intra-oral examination. Again, for both of these, like your history taking, develop a systematic method. So when you do your extra-oral exam, I generally start behind the patient, examine the neck, we're feeling for lumps, bumps, anything that's abnormal, TMJ, have a feel, any crepitus, any noises, any clicks. How wide can they open? That's really important. What's their mouth opening like? Do they have any trismus? If they do, why is that? Is that normal? Is this something new? And again, you might examine cranial nerves depending on the reason for presentation. So commonly it would be the fifth or the seventh cranial nerve, but you need to be aware of how to examine the other cranial nerves. Once you've done your extra-oral, we're going to move on to intra-oral. And again, systematic approach. So start with the soft tissues, lift the tongue up, have a look at the floor of the mouth, stick the tongue out, right, left, touch the roof of the mouth, look at the sides of the tongue, look at the dental hard tissues, anything abnormal, put your finger around the sulcuses in the uh, floor of the mouth and have a feel. All of that, we need to have a, a good um, idea of, of what's going on. Is there anything abnormal here? But a structured approach is really important. And this examination and history taking, you need to have it so it's reproducible for every patient that comes in and you do the same method for each patient. Then when you come to do it in an examination, for example, it's like second nature and it's not something you've got to think about. You just do it automatically. Document all of those findings, 
bring it together with the history to give you an idea of what you think the diagnosis is. Obviously then you'll do some investigations and that's more likely, most likely going to be imaging and then you can formulate your treatment plan. So when we talk about patient factors, which is the first thing I'm going to talk about, there are five different components to this. So one is the medical history, I've touched on that already. Second is their age. So we know that from the literature, that certainly with third molars, as soon as you get into your late 20s and above, that surgery gets more complicated and complications, the rate of complications increases. So age is important. Also, in this day and age, patients are living longer and therefore they may have more comorbidities. Bone density changes with age and healing changes with age. So think about their age. Is this likely to, to cause any issues with what we're going to do? Their BMI is really important. Now, we don't routinely calculate a patient's BMI, their body mass index, for local anaesthetic procedures. Certainly for conscious sedation, whether it's intravenous or inhalation, we would do a BMI and also for general anaesthesia. Have a look at the patient, try and get an idea what their BMI is. And with an increased BMI, which is a very gross method of assessing a patient, they're likely to have comorbidities. So increased BMI generally comes with diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, etc. It also might mean that access, so their necks might be quite short, mouths quite small and sometimes small mouth opening. So access can quite, be quite difficult for patients with a high BMI as well. So that needs to be a consideration. I mentioned patient anxiety. You can use the MDAS, Modified Dental Anxiety Scale, to score their anxiety. And it's really important to get an idea of the patient's level of anxiety before treatment, which may then mean that if you're offering conscious sedation or general anaesthesia, that's something you would consider, or if that's something you're going to refer them on to a colleague for. And bringing all of that together, you can formulate an ASA grade. So the American Society for Anesthesiologists will give you a grade. Ones and twos are generally what we would recommend for patients to be in primary care. There might be a patient with an ASA 3. It very depends why it's an ASA 3. But certainly anything from a 3 upwards, you, you should be thinking about referring those patients on. So bring all that together to give you an idea of the patient factors that are going to affect the procedure. The second one is operator factors. So you as the clinician, how do you fit into this? How is this going to be for you? So think about your competence, your level of experience. Is this something you can do, you've done before, you've done a lot of, you're confident with? If not, maybe I should be referring this to a colleague or doing it with a colleague. The environment that you work in is really important as well. You might be a very experienced operator in a new environment with an assistant that's not experienced and there's nobody else around in the environment to give you support if needs be. And with that environment comes kit. So think about what kit is there. It's, you know, if you're working in a place that you're not familiar with, it's great to have a good route around the cupboards. What have we got here? If I need plan B, what have I got that I can go into plan B? So your experience is really important, but the support and the environment that surrounds you will impact on your experience. So think about all of those things together. Think about your assistant. How experienced is your assistant? Is there anybody else around if I need some support today? So think about operator factors. And the third thing to think about is surgical factors. So the procedure itself. I've mentioned access, but how wide is the mouth opening if it's an intraoral procedure? What's going on with the surgical site itself? If it's an extraction, what's the status of the crown? What does the image tell me? What are the roots like? What's the bone density like? Is there any pathology? Are there any vital structures around here? Inferior alveolar nerve, maxillary antrum, all of those things, any pathology. So the assessment of the, the clinical procedure itself and what you're going to do is really important. And that, again, will give you an idea for the complexity of this procedure. Just staying with surgical factors, think about some other things that might throw you a curveball. So density of bone I've mentioned, but if it's really dense bone, this is going to be quite difficult. Patients who have short clinical crowns, often with signs of attrition, those extractions can be quite difficult. Hypercementosis, 
long divergent roots such as lower first molars sometimes have really long roots and if they're splayed or divergent that can make life really interesting and difficult. If there's extensive caries in the tooth, root caries, heavy restorations, root canal treatment, all of these things together will make life more difficult. One classic misnomer is adults who have deciduous retained teeth. So there's a reason that that deciduous tooth is still present in that 30 year old patient. They're not going to be easy. Generally they can be quite difficult, so don't think they're just going to pop out and just book 15 minutes. And think about the pathology that's present as well. That often will impact you and the procedure that you're going to carry out. So those things I've just mentioned often are a little bit curveballs that might give you some additional issues that you weren't expecting. So just to summarise those three things that we're going to think about, the operator, the patient, the procedure itself, ideally you want to bring all of that information together to formulate whether this is going to be straightforward, advanced or complex and you can use that SAC classification to formulate that plan and give you an idea of what's ahead of you. I hope that's been helpful for that bite-sized revision session on patient assessment. Please subscribe to the channel, many more videos to come. Any questions, please drop me a message. Thanks for listening.